I'm so glad that you're here in the house of God with us today. I'm so glad that you're a part of what God's doing here today. Um, just God has blessed us in so many ways and touched. And I know many of you are facing situations right now or something's happened in your heart and life this, this morning, maybe even this week. And I just want to say thank you for being here today. Thank you for being a part. It means so much when I look out here and I see your face and I see who you are. And because whatever happened in your life this week, you made a decision to be in the house of God. You made a right decision. And we say it around here all the time. We need each other. I need you. You need me. You didn't think that, but you really do. <laughs> but we need each other. And we need this corporate worship, this corporate fellowship, and what God is doing. So thank you so much for being here. It's just been an honor this week. I uh, many of you know about our, our Kenya project, and we were able to send a check off for that this past week. And when the person that I've been working with on that project told me, they said I was just telling somebody randomly in my family about it, and all I could do was cry when we were when we let them know what was going on. And we're saving one more daughter. We're saving one more son. We may never get to go to Kenya, but because of your faithfulness and tithing, giving, offerings, we were there this week. And God's grace has been sufficient. I think about all the other things that we've done this week, and I just want to say thank you. I, th I want to thank you for ministering in Tiff County, in Colquitt County, in Des Moines, Iowa, in Kenya, and wherever we are, because God's work is being done I, I, I was talking to somebody that was in the hospital. They would rather be here than in the hospital. <laughs> and so they were talking, and they said, you don't know what it is to have this connection online. And I just want to just say hey to our online community today. I hate that you're not in the house, but I'm glad you're watching with us and believing that God's going to do great things for you. I'm going to start a new series this morning. And let me say this about the tithing, giving, the offering. You may be new here. You can text to give, online giving, and we have two boxes as you go out. But if you would like to give, it's back there. It's available for you. We never do anything. How many of you know this is a house full of cheerful givers? We don't have to. We get to. We don't, you know, our, our tithe is our command by the Lord. But then our offerings, we just get to do all that. And it's so great to be able to do that. So thank you for that. I want you to go with me to Exodus chapter 15, Exodus chapter 15, starting a new series this morning called Victory Formation. How many of your prayer life got better last night? Anybody's prayer life? My prayer life's not that good right now, if y'all want to know that. Not on Saturdays, on Sundays I'm good. Saturdays my prayer life is in the, in the tank right now, but this too will pass may pass like a kidney stone, but it will still pass. And we all know that, but we're, we're in that season. But Braves won. <laughs> I had to hang my hat somewhere, <laughs> and so Braves won. But just wanting to tell you, a lot of times we talk about victory formation, where we are, because you know in that victory formation and the things that are there a lot of times, we know that that's at the end of the game, and at the end of the game, they're, they're, you're letting people know, hey, the victory, the time's just got to run out, but the victory is already in hand. There's so many times in our spiritual life that we face this. We know that we've won. If you know you're saved today, you've won. If you know that your eternity has been secured, you have won. You understand who you are. So, but there is still things to face in this life that we have to face. Now, we have to pick how we're going to face these things in our life. We have to pick the way that we're going to go about things. Are we going to do it just off of our feelings? Or are we going to do them off of who we know that God is? That understanding that the victory is there but we still have to fight the battle sometimes. We still have to get our minds right sometimes. Each of you made a decision when you came in here this morning that whether you were going to worship God, you made a decision. And worship 
is an attitude and an action. It's an action and an attitude that I walk in here and, and, and there's been occasions in all of our lives that we walked into certain places and said, I'm going to be grumpy today. Be honest. I'm just going to be grumpy today. I'm just going to be mad today. Nobody's done anything to me. Nobody said anything wrong to me. But I made that decision. And then sometimes our heart is broken. And we have those moments that we feel that weight and that anxiety and those things that happen there. And so we're there in this moment that our worship, our praise, our obedience is an action, but it's also an attitude that we have. That what is my attitude? All the parents in here can say these words. You've had to look at your child at some time in their life and said, if you don't straighten up your attitude, we are about to have a discussion. We are about to have a discussion about your attitude. There's times that I've had to look in the mirror at that person and said, you and I have got to have a conversation because your attitude is not lining up with who you are, with how much you've been blessed, with what God's done in your life. And I've had to look at the person in the mirror and say, hey, you know who you are in Jesus Christ. And not to allow any shame, any disappointments, any bitterness, anything to get in my life that would change my worship, my praise, and my obedience to God. And so when we understand this moment, worship is not just what we do on Sunday. I, I, I'm so We're so blessed. How many of you know we're blessed to have the worship team that we have? We are blessed. They lead us in worship. But see, you first got to lead yourself in worship. It's not always about them. Sometimes it's about my attitude when I enter into the house of God. Sometimes it's my attitude when I walk into my workplace that I prayed for. You remember praying for some of the things that you prayed for? God, just give me and bless me. And then you got double the amount of work and you're saying, Lord, what in the world did I ask for? God, just give me a large family. Welcome. God, just let these things happen in my life. And then when you get there in those moments in your life, then your attitude gets bad and the blessing becomes a curse. And if we're not careful, our worship suffers so we don't stay in that victory formation. Our praise suffers so we don't stay in that victory formation. Our obedience starts to suffer because we don't stay in that victory formation. And so what we've got to understand is God teach us with our attitude and our actions to stay in that victory formation knowing that Christ has a plan, that everything that's coming to me right now, that I understand that all things are working for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose, but God, let my attitude be right. God, let my actions be right. Don't let me be the person that walks into everything in my life with arms folded, wondering how people are going to mess it up. Wondering about those things in my life. Let me show you this in Exodus chapter 15. Then Miriam, the prophet, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and dances. And Miriam answered them. Now Miriam answered them. Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. How many of you know singing in church is biblical? But singing on Monday is biblical too. On Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we need to sing to the Lord. I know you like all kinds of music. I know you like all kinds of things. But there is sometimes where I've got to get in victory formation, and I can't sing.
you know, y'all death metal going to work, and you're going, how's everybody doing? They're a little freaked out by you right now. You know, listen to country music on the way. You've lost, by the time you got to work, you've lost your wife, your truck, and your farm. <laughs> and you wonder why your attitude's messed up sometimes. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider has been thrown into the sea. Praise, worship is an attitude and an action. Worship is not passive. Let me say this to you. Worship is not passive. How many of you got a little bit louder last night as you were screaming at the TV? How many of you got a little louder at the kids' ball game this past week? How many of you got a little bit louder in that moment? Because it is not passive. What our affections are turned to, what our attitude is turned to, what who we are, it's not passive. If you care, there's going to be an emotion, there's going to be an action, there's going to be an attitude that comes in your life that you have to say at that moment, this is where my affections are. This is where my emotions are. This is where I am in my mind, my body, and my spirit. And I've got to turn it that way and say, Jan, is it really you that I'm worshiping? Is it really you that I'm praying? First John reminds us not to have any idols in our life. How many of you know, so even as believers, we can allow little things in our life that should not be there? Our bad attitude sometimes, our critical spirit sometimes, those moments. And so as a believer in Jesus Christ, I've got to say, God, check me in my worship, in my praise, because if I'm not worshiping the King of kings and Lord of lords, everybody's worshiping something. Some people worship their house, their car. Some people worship their children. Some people worship an identity. Some people worship different things in their life. But everybody worships. As a believer in Jesus Christ, I've got to say these words. And Margaret did a great job on forgiveness this past week. And I've thought so much about that in our prayer time, in our pray first. And I've thought so much about that. Lord... Forgive me for any idols that I've set up in my life, whether that be the idol of church, of religion, of no matter what it is. God, don't let me have any idols in my life. God, let me worship you fully with all of my heart, with all of my mind, with all of my being. God, don't let me worship comfort. Don't let me worship tradition. Don't let me worship my routine. God, don't let me worship any of those things, God. Because in myself, I know that I can allow idols in, and I've got to say these words, God, don't let there be any idols in my life. Notice this. You'll see this in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. It says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power, and Godhead, so that we are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. See, as a world and as a culture, our thoughts have become so darkened, we don't know who we are. We don't understand why it's important to be in the house of God. We don't understand why our marriages are so important. We don't understand these things because we've allowed idols to get in our life. And we're not worshiping the true and the living God. And because of that, we wonder why we can't think correctly. We wonder why we can't act correctly. We wonder why we can't line up with the Word of God. But we've allowed these things to come in. Now notice this. So God, 
professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. The birds, the four-footed animals, creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their own bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So we wonder why we're not stable in our homes. We wonder why that we're not stable in our relationships. We wonder why that we've allowed as believers in Jesus Christ little things to get in our life that have become major things in our life. Generations are growing up without knowing who they are because we allowed little things into our life, into our churches, into those moments in our life because we changed our affection from the Creator to the creation. We said things like this, and please pay attention to me. We said that family time is more important than worship time. But let me tell you, family time should be worship time. And worship time should be family time. We've allowed little things to get in our life that's turned our affection toward the creation instead of the creator. We've allowed little moments to, to kind of just seep in to our moments that we have. And we wonder why our affections, why our actions, why our attitude has slipped and slipped and slipped. And now we're dealing with a culture that doesn't know who they are. Now we're dealing with families that don't know who they are. And so what do we do in the middle of this battle that we're in? We can call it the cultural battle, but it's not. It's the spiritual battle. And so what do we do in the middle of this? How do we make it right? And as believers, we've got to lead the way. So I'm going to ask you to lead in worship this morning. I'm going to ask each one of you, if you cannot sing, if you cannot dance on, you know, in rhythm, I'm going to ask every single person here, decide today that this day I will lead in worship. I will lead it at my work, at my school, and wherever I am. God, I'm going to lead in worship. Let me show you some things here. How do you worship? First thing I want to show you about this is Psalm 63, 4. It says, that's why I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. I will lift up my hands. Psalms 134 verse 2 said, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. I know many of you were not raised raising your hand or clapping in church or any of those things. Shanna had a friend one time. She carried to church. She was raised in another uh, tradition or denomination, and she was raised. She, they were sitting in the back. There was a lady in the front raising her hand here in the choir, and, and her friend Candy started waving back. She said, I thought she was just being friendly. <laughs> Sometimes there's that moment, but it's a scriptural principle to lift out our hands. It is a scriptural principle, not just about the action, but the attitude. When I say, God, there's nothing in my hands that I can bring to you, all I bring to you is my heart. All I bring to you is my mind. All I bring, I'm not having, I'm not coming in with preconceived ideas in my life or anything like that. But Lord, I bring you what I have. I'm not going to be tight fist about it. I'm not going to say, I'll just take care of it myself. No, I'm saying, God, I surrender fully to you when I lift up holy hands without wrath, without doubt. And I say, God, do a work in my life. God, whatever you want to have in my life, God, let me get rid of everything that I need to get rid of, and God, I'll receive everything that you have for me. Now, worship is an attitude. Worship is an action. The first thing I want to show you this is, and these things were written aforetime for our learning. Moses worshiped God by lifting up his hands. 
He worshiped God by lifting up his hands. And let me show you his, his example. The first thing he lifted up his hands for is for deliverance. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 26, they were facing the Red Sea. It said, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back on the Egyptians, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came to the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. How many of you know that God still does miracles? And the waters were walled to them in their right hand and on their left hand. Now I want to show you this, that they needed deliverance. The Egyptians were behind them. The Red Sea was in front of them, and they needed deliverance for their life. They were walking out of bondage. But how many of you know they were still dealing with some of the problems of their bondage? And God said, I'm going to bring you to a place to show you I am the God that can deliver you. I want to tell somebody today, you may have been dealing with a sin in your life, but God can still deliver you. Your family may be dealing with a sin right now, but God can still deliver you and set you free by the power. You say, Pastor, I'm saved, and you're still dealing with some lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But let me tell you, the Scripture makes it known. Yes, we're going to come to some red seas in our life, but I believe in the God that can still deliver. I believe in the God that can still set you free. You say, Pastor, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. But whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Once addicted to whatever the addiction is, whom the Son sets free can be free indeed. If it's religion that you're addicted to, you can be free by the power and grace of God and find a relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what the addiction is. It doesn't matter what the habit is. That the Son will set you free. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 3 says, For this one who has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he built the house, has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he has built all things. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those which would be spoken afterwards. But Christ, but Christ, but Christ as the Son of as son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast to the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. I want to share this with somebody today. Christ is building the house. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that house can be clean, it can be delivered, and you need to practice daily. God, I'm going to worship you by surrendering daily. I'm going to praise you by surrendering daily. I'm going to say, God, I don't have all this together, and I don't even know where together is, but today I will make a decision to lift up holy hands without wrath or without doubt, and I will worship, I will praise, and I will be obedient. I want to tell somebody today, you prayed some prayers this week, didn't you? Prayed some prayers this week. God heard those prayers. And just because you didn't see the answer this week doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan. You may not saw it, but God still has a plan. God had a plan when it looked like there was no plan and they were just wandering around in the wilderness and nobody knew what was going on. But God said, I'm about to set them up for the greatest victory that they can even imagine. And all they have to do is walk. Let me tell somebody today, you walk in worship. You walk in praise. You walk in obedience right now. And God has the deliverance. It may look like you're wandering to everybody else, but all you're doing is walking in faith. 
You're walking in worship. You're walking in saying, God, I'm going to praise you. If you've got something to praise God about, just take about 15 seconds right now and just say, God, I praise you for my life. I praise you for what you've done. I worship you. I honor you right now. God, I know you brought me this far, God. I thank you for the food and the shelter. God, I praise you for my deliverance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sometimes you just need a praise break. Sometimes you just need a moment that you just simply say, God, I know I haven't seen it yet, but I know you're still God. And if you did that 4,000 years ago for them, you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And I know that you can do exceedingly abundantly above what we even asked or think. The second thing I want you to see is we worship during the battle. We worship during the battle. Next is chapter 17, verse 9. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out. Fight with the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. He had the staff of God. He was the shepherd. He was doing the work. So Joshua did as Moses said and fought with the Amalekites. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was. When Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, the Amalekites prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. I want to tell somebody today, and I want to tell our church today, it's important for us to meet at 9 and 11 on Sundays. You know why? Because there's a moment that you're going to feel drained. You're going to feel weary. You're not going to know what to do. And there needs to be somebody that comes to you and tell you, I'm not going to let you fall. And I'm not going to let your hands go down. And I'm not going to allow the moment to take you under. We are standing side by side as the body of Christ. As brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, we stand side by side. You may be going through trouble right now, but we're here with you in Jesus' name. We're going to let the work of grace be done right now. It did not catch God off guard, and you've got an army standing beside of you right now. That God's going to do work. You may be in the battle right now but the victory is already the Lord's you may not understand right now but the victory is the Lord's fight the battle when you get weak we'll hold up your hands the work of grace is going to be done you're right in the middle of the battle but lift up your hands your redemption draweth nigh the work of grace will be done because you need to say God I know you brought me this far and whatever my situation is right now God I know you can still do how many of you know his power is still real the blood is still real my family is still real. Whatever it is in my life, it is still real. And it is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And I need to tell somebody today, God has not forgotten about where you are. He knows what you're going through right now. God knows. God knows. We're just going to take a moment. I'm not finished yet, but if you'll close your eyes and bow your heads right there where you are. Lord Jesus, you know every need. You know every heart. You know the person that feels lonely. You know the person that's hurting. And Lord, right now, I pray by your grace, your mercy, and your love. God, what they've been praying for, 
God, I pray that it will come to pass in Jesus' name. You have never left them. You've never forsaken them. You went with them all the way. And right there where you are, say, God, I don't understand everything, but God, I trust you. If that's your heart today and you say, God, I don't understand everything, but I trust you, I want you to lift both hands to heaven right now and say, God, I don't understand and I can't comprehend, but God, I know that you have a plan and I know you have a purpose, God, and that work of grace and mercy and love, God, to be done right now. God, I pray that you'll make a way where there is no way. God, give them a stream in the desert, Lord. God, let that work of grace be done, God. God, not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, God. God, I pray that you heal the brokenhearted right now. God, I pray that you heal the brokenhearted, the people that are in this sanctuary, the people that are online right now. God, I pray that you heal the brokenhearted right now. God, the ones that are struggling emotionally, physically, spiritually, Lord. God, the ones that don't understand. God, I pray that you heal them right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Now all over the sanctuary, let's just give the Lord an ovation of praise and worship. I'm not finished, but I want to I want to just be pastor for just a minute, okay? 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, it talks about spiritual gifts, and one of those is tongues and interpretations of tongues. And it's done decently and in order. And we're going to do those things. But how many of you know we're glad when God intervenes on our plans and does His plans? So that's who we are. The third thing I want to share with you is the worship for healing. Israel had disobeyed. They allowed their mouth to become their focus. They allowed their attitudes to become their worship. And they started complaining. Now let me share this with you. I see all through the scriptures when we allow our mouth not to be controlled, we end up somewhere we don't want to be, hurt, hopeless, and without help. Children of Israel did the same thing. They complained. They grumbled. They started that moment that they were in And I want you to understand this. In the moment that they were in, they started complaining. And God allowed vipers, serpents, snakes, whatever you want to call it, to allow to be turned loose in the camp. And literally, people were hurt and they were dying because they allowed. Because we understand this about our mouth. You say, well, I'm just saying it. No, the scripture says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so I want you to see this in Numbers chapter 21, verse 7. It said, therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. How many of you think Moses is a great man of God? (laughs) Somebody that's been complaining, fussing, and grumbling came to you and said, we need to be healed. And Moses prays for him. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Let me show you this in John chapter 3, verse 14. It will help explain this. It says, And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. These things were written aforetime for our learning That when we get in a time that we need healing, where do we look? We look toward the cross. He's teaching us at this moment that we're in right now. You may be hurt right now. You may be sick emotionally, physically, spiritually. But where am I going to look in my worship? I can let my hands hang down. I can be mad. I can even ball them up in a fist. I can either go through that. 
But when he lifted up the serpent, he lifts up his hands for the only one that can heal the brokenhearted. For the only one that can change the situation. I want you to see this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. He said, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so e- easily ensnares us, and let us run this in, this run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, when we need healing in our life, we look to him. He's no longer on the cross. Now he sits at the right hand of the Father. And every time you're hurting and you say, Father, I'm hurting. I don't understand what I'm going through. I don't understand the moment that I am. But you lift up your hands. You lift up your head. You look to the author and the finisher of your faith. And no matter what you're going through right now, there is healing at the throne room of God. And God's going to do His work of grace. I need some of you to understand. Say, Pastor, I'm going through some difficult times. I don't understand where my heart is. I don't understand where my mind is. Shame has got into my life. Bitterness has got into my life. Unforgiveness has got into my life. I don't understand. How many of you know God still heals from all those things? God still heals cancer. God still heals diseases. God still does a work of grace. I don't understand it all. I can't comprehend it all. But I will tell you today, God in His grace, His mercy, and His love will make a way in Jesus' name. So, the decision today is, where's my attitude at? Where's my attitude at? I want this team to lead me in worship on Sunday. But before they can, I've got to lead myself to Him. If I don't lead myself to Him, they can do whatever they want to do. Pastor can preach whatever he wants to preach. Team leaders can do whatever they want to do. But I've got to make up in my mind and my heart today, God, I'm going to lift up holy hands. God, I will praise you. I will honor you. God, whatever I have to do, God, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And I want somebody to understand this today. You say, Pastor, do you just want us to be more demonstrative in worship? No, no, no. If that's you, do it. Go ahead. Dance. Sing. Shout. But what I wanted to do is, on Monday morning, when you don't think that it's going to happen, and you feel so defeated, you don't know where to go, that you'll lift up holy hands and say, God, I know you brought me to it, and I know you're going to bring me through it in Jesus' name. I want you on Tuesday when you've had some of the greatest victories that you can even imagine. Some of us this past week, we prayed for things. We saw God make a way. Can I get an amen from any farmer that's sitting here today? Can I get any, you know, you didn't know how it was going to happen. God just did. Whatever it may be in our life, we need to say these words, God. I know who you are. And God, I will worship you. I will praise you. I will adore you. I want you to stand with me this morning. I want to read one last scripture. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 30. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the Lord, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed the Lord and his servant Moses. I don't know where your Red Sea is right now, but I know God can deliver you. I don't know where your Red Sea is right now, but I know God can heal you. I don't know where your battle is right now, but we're in victory formation right now. Not for ourselves, 
but we know that the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. I know the work of grace is going to be done because He said He'd never leave you. He would never forsake you. And He would go with you all the way, even to the end of the age. And I don't care where you are. I don't care what you're going through. Go ahead and make that victory formation in your mind, in your attitude. Go ahead and make that victory formation in your actions. I will lift up holy hands without wrath or without doubt. I will clap and nobody knows why I'm clapping, but the Lord does. Because I believe that I'm going to have a breakthrough. I believe that God's work of grace is going to be done. I believe that whatever it may be in my life, that that work of grace is going to be done. So I'm going to ask for a very simple prayer today. I'm going to ask for everybody that wants to be in victory formation to lift both hands to heaven right now and say, God, I'm deciding right now for the rest of this day, for the rest of the week, I will be in victory formation. I will praise you. I will honor you. God, just pour out your heart right there where you are. Say, I'm going to be in victory formation right now. I'm going to do everything that I know to do to praise you, to worship you, to be obedient to you right now. And God, I already make up in my mind, in my heart right now, that I'm working from victory in Jesus' name. I'm working from victory in Jesus' name. Let that work of grace be done. God, we give you the honor and the praise. Hallelujah. You can lower those hands right now. Just remain with your head bowed and your eyes closed just for another moment. You say, Pastor, I'm so desperate that I want to operate my life from victory formation. But I don't know Him as my Lord and Savior. So Lord, I want my life to change. I've worked from my own way, my own formation, and who I am long enough. But I'm ready this morning to give everything to Jesus. And I want to pray a simple prayer with you if that's you. And I want everybody to pray this with me. Lord Jesus, please forgive me. Let your blood wash away all of my sins. I will serve you as my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name. Still with your head bowed and your eyes closed just for another moment. Online, if you did that, put that in the comments. We want to help you with your next steps to get you in church, to get you in a small group. Whatever you need, we're going to help you with it. But you say in this sanctuary right now, I have decided to follow Jesus Christ. And if that's you, just lift up your hand right there where you are. Say, Pastor, I have made a decision. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can lower those hands. And I want the loudest ovation that we've had all day long. God, I praise you. I honor you. God, I adore you. God, I thank you for the kingdom. I thank you for grace. I thank you for mercy. I thank you for love. I thank you for what you started this morning, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want the prayer team to come at this time. And as they come, if you need special prayer, they're going to help you. They're going to pray with you. We don't do life by ourselves. When Moses' hands was going to fall, Aaron and her was there to lift them back up. So I want somebody to lift up your hands this morning. You say, Pastor, I need prayer this morning. And I believe that the work of grace is going to be done right now. They're going to sing this again. God bless you.